So hello everyone, my name is Fosita and I'm the founder of FON. And yeah, if you're just coming to our YouTube channel for the first time, and here at FON, we try to share scholarship information and invite scholars that have won different scholarships to help people that are trying to apply for these scholarships for the first time to get insight on how to go about it. So yeah, if you're looking for that kind of um, information and you'd like to keep track of the different videos that we're going to upload, feel free to subscribe. And then subsequently, every single time we upload a new video, you can just um, see a notification and come right ahead and watch. So today uh, we are going to be talking about the Shevlin Scholarship. And I'm really glad that we have um, a number of people in the house who are probably also working on their essays. So the first thing I'm going to say before I go ahead is that if you've already written your essays and you're about to submit and you're feeling under intense pressure, you're feeling like you don't know whether you're going to succeed and all of that, I would just ask you to pause for just a minute and take a deep breath. Just take a deep breath. has ever succeeded by not trying. I know some of you are afraid. You don't even know whether you want to submit your essays or not, but you're never really going to know if you'll be selected unless you actually go ahead and submit your essays. So if you're feeling afraid, if you're feeling overwhelmed, just take a deep breath. Everything is going to be fine. What's important is that you have the courage to start and you're going to finish what you started. So um, first and foremost, I would like to say that the views expressed in these videos are my views. They do not express the views of the SCDO or the Shevlin body, right? These are my own views, expressing my views of uh, the scholarship application process, writing the essays, and do not in any way um, describe the opinion of Shevlin. So I just want to make that very clear. So we'll jump right into it. Um, most of us that are here already know about Shevlin, but just to iterate, reiterate the point, Shevlin is a body that is focused on trying to engender development in different countries by offering fully funded scholarships to people in over 150 countries to come to the UK to study so that they can gain skills, create networks, you know, with other young leaders and go back to their home countries, create impact. So that's just like what Shevlin is about in a nutshell. Shevning is a UK government funded scholarship. They are administered by the FCDO, which is a foreign Commonwealth Development Office. And they have branches across, all, I think, all the Commonwealth countries, really. So, yeah, Shevning gives fully funded scholarship. It doesn't matter what university you select, whether it's Oxford, whether it's Cambridge, or whether it's Imperial College, and so on. Shevning, once you've gotten the scholarship, Shevning is going to sponsor your tuition and you know, your cost of living and all that for you to come study in the UK so you can gain the skills to go back and impact your home country. I hope that's clear. Again, if you're following, please type on the chat that you're following so that I know that you can hear me. Please, if you're following, type something on the chat so that I know that you're following, please. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much. So there are, uh, if you're starting the application for the first time, it's good to know that you have to have your degree certificate because it's part of the documents that are required. You're going to also need your passport because there's a segment in the application um, platform that will request your passports. So you just like take a picture of your passport data page. You can convert, I think it requires JPEG. It accept, I think it's acceptable JPEG and PDF format. You don't necessarily have, you don't have to really have um, recommendation letters, just in case some of you are thinking about that. But it's good to know the people that you want to be your recommenders so that you can include their name. And of course, um, these people only become relevant after you've been shortlisted for the scholarship. So once you're shortlisted, then these people are then required to send a recommendation to Shevin on your behalf prior to your interview date. So that's sort of how it works. So you don't have to worry about having a recommendation letter at this point. You just have to know the people that you're thinking of using for your recommendation, right? So then, um, like I mentioned before, your degree certificate, your passport, and then if you have your transcript, yeah, your transcript, very important. I uploaded two transcripts. I had done a diploma in technology and management uh, after, shortly after my bachelor's degree in law. So I uploaded both the transcripts for my bachelor's degree as well as a transcript for the diploma that I did. 
So I don't think there's any, there's no rule that says that you can't upload as many transcripts as you have. As long as they are higher than secondary education, please go ahead and upload the transcripts, right? And then of course, if you have several different degrees, please also feel free to upload them, including if you have a master's degree. Shevning doesn't say that we don't sponsor people that already have masters. Please, if you have a master's in a Nigerian university or any other university, you can still apply for Shevning, right? So about eligibility, Nigeria is one of the countries that falls under eligibility as well as some other African countries, but I don't know if it's every African country. So to find out for yourself, it would be good to just go to the website and quickly check, click on the Shevning Awards folder and check to see if your country is listed among the ones that are being offered the Shevning Scholarship. So that way you can then tell. It's actually from there that you click on it, then it then takes you to the application link. That's the application platform to start with. It's just pretty useful to not rush um, filling the form because some people have filled the form wrongly and they got rejected outright. So one of the key things to do is to calculate the number of hours that you've worked. Form to fill in the form, you're going to see that there's a space where you indicate the job um, via the place that you worked and the number of hours. So you calculate it automatically by the number of weeks. So the average number of hours that people work in a week is like 45 hours. So if Shevney says that we require a minimum of 2,800 hours, so you're supposed to cross check whether if you, if you multiply the 45 hours a week in whichever rule you're currently doing by the 12th month or by the 24th month, depending if it has been two years, you're going to be able to get the required number that Shevning is requesting. So the good news is that Shevning doesn't just accept just um, employment, like core formal employment. If even if it's an internship, Shevning still accepts it, right? So if, it, if it's an internship, if it's, even if it's like unpaid, unpaid um, volunteering, just check the website. You'll see that they wrote, wrote it down there clearly that Shevning also accepts internship opportunities. That's internship um, experience to count towards the number of hours that you need. So what you need to do is to first write out the experiences that you have and check the number of years. If you worked for up to three years, you can simply just put that you worked, uh, put the number of hours per week and state how many years it has been. And you automatically, it automatically calculate the number of hours and you can see that you've exceeded the Chevening minimum. But if you put the wrong number of hours or the wrong number of years by mistake, you might get rejected outright. It has happened to some people. So that's why I actually spend time trying to explain this. Take your time in filling the form. It's useful to have written your essays first and then fill the form when you're not under pressure. Please don't fill the form when you're under pressure, right? Because you're going to miss out some things that might end up like getting you rejected for eligibility issues outright. So then we jump into the essays, right? I'm going to just quickly run through um, the different requirements so that we can pick, uh, so that we can like hear from you because I want to be very interactive. I know you have a lot of burning questions. I'm sure now that the deadline is like very close. So I'm just going to run through the requirements. So listen very carefully, and then you can ask your questions. You ask your question based on the essays that you've already written, right? So great. The first essay, there are four of them. There's a leadership essay. There's the career plan essay. There's a study in the UK essay or study justification essay. And then there's a networking essay. There are four major essays that you have to write to be selected for the Shevin Scholarship. So each of these essays have like different um, things that they are looking for, really. When the idea is that what Shevin is trying to do is to bring young leaders that they feel are influential, uh, people that they feel are like, expert or people that are already working that's why they require you to have some work experience you know people that can go back with the skills that they've acquired from the scholarship to actually create impact in their home country so that's sort of the mindset or the framework to think about your essays from right so you start from the leadership essay but you can start from any essay really but i started from the leadership essay mostly because i felt that from carefully outlining what your leadership qualities are as well as the different places that you've um, exhibited leadership, you can clearly now be able to start to streamline um, your to streamline the rest of your essays based on your leadership experiences. So that's sort of like a good way to start. But if you feel more confident starting from a different one, please feel very free to do. So for the leadership essay, you're going to 
to be very effective in describing your leadership it's very useful to use the star approach and using the star approach the star situation please if your if your if your mic is on can you can you mute yourself please okay okay great so there's you use a star approach to to write your leadership essay so the s stands for situation the t stands for the task a stands for the action that you took, and then the R stands for the result that came as a result of the action that you took. So I'm just going to start from the first one, which is the S, the situation. In trying to structure your leadership experiences, um, you start from the situation. For example, I'll just give an example. When I was an undergraduate, um, there were, I was the president of a literary club where I, mentored young people that were writing and expressing themselves as a way of improving themselves, improving their English language, as well as improving their writing ability. Of course, which I'm sure that academic writing. That the situation for me in one of my leadership experiences was that the people, the, a lot of the students wanted to get published because for every writer, the greatest aspiration is being read not necessarily selling your work is actually being read. Just like a musician wants people to listen to them, a writer wants to be read. So publication is like the ultimate dream of most writers. So a lot of the young students that were, I was working with wanted to get published and there was an opportunity by the Association of Nigerian Authors, but they required in, everybody, including the students to pay 3,000 naira for a reading fee for the prize that they were organizing. And then even if they paid the amount, it wasn't going to guarantee that they would get published. So, you know, it felt like the amount was a lot. A lot of people in, on campus at the time were getting up like 5,000 Naira a week for upkeep. So imagine spending 3,000 out of that mega amount. Then it means that, you know, they, they both don't have a guarantee that their dreams are going to be achieved and they also don't have enough money to take care of themselves. So I decided to do something about it. So there was a situation which is the fact that there were no um, reading, reading competitions that favored undergraduates at the time. That was in 2017. There was no literary reading competition in the three zones that favored undergraduates. There was one for poetry, the Nigerian Poetry Prize or something. Yeah, there's one for poetry. And there were some for fiction, like the, the one that Adichie was hosting, the Farafina Trust Writing Workshop, but there was none for the three zones in literature, right? So that was like the situation. The task was trying to figure out how to create a prize that would favor undergraduates and that would charge them no fees. Then the task that I undertook to solve that problem, which is the situation, was to create a literary prize that would be free for all undergraduates to submit to, right? And then I went ahead to um, collaborate with partners to raise the money for the prize as well as get people that will judge the prize, right? I mentioned writing a note to the Commonwealth Writers Association. They published the, the literary contest on their website, then it went viral. So that was actually how I was able to get the money for the prize in the first place. And then we eventually got over 480 submissions in that first edition. And the, the submissions came from over 30 universities. Now, the funny thing is that this experience didn't directly relate to what I was applying for because what I was applying for is something in entrepreneurship, but then it had elements. The elements is that I, I was trying to show that I was a problem solving individual and that the problem solving approach started right from my undergraduate days. But what we're trying to discuss here is how to structure your leadership experiences to follow the STAR approach. The situation, the fact that there was no literary contest that favored undergraduates, there was a task how to create literary prizes that can favor undergraduates everywhere in Nigeria. Then there was the action, which was actually creating the literary prize, administering it, and ensuring that people knew about it so that they could submit. Then what did it result to? Over 480 submissions from 30 universities and getting published in the Sun newspaper in that year. So that's sort of how to think about it. I'm not saying that your leadership experience will be the same. Everybody has different leadership experiences. 
But the point is that if you're going to write it, you're going to have to structure it to follow the STAR approach. It makes it easier for the panelists to read. And believe me when I tell you that some of the panelists are going to be Chevron scholars themselves. So they know how they structured their own essays when they were selected. So they're going to be looking out to see if your essays reflect that. And if your essays don't reflect that, you're going to be rejected. You're just going to be waiting till January to be rejected. So if your essays are not structured that way, now would be a pretty good time to just sort of structure your essay in that way. And I'm telling you because it was my own experience, right? Okay, great. So we're going to move forward to the networking essay. So the networking essay also still follows a star approach. But the difference between the leadership essay and the networking essay is that in the networking essay, you're trying to focus on uh, how exactly you've been able to network with different people. You need to be able to show that you're the type of person that is influential. Someone that is influential is not just someone that knows people. Someone can know a lot of people and not be influential. Someone that is influential is someone that is able to leverage the relationship that they have with other people to do things, to ac accomplish things. Someone that is influential can use the relationships that they have with a large number of people to organize those people together towards a common goal. And he would do it without actually paying them because he has a relationship with them. So the Shevnim board that is looking at your essay is probably going to look, be looking out for whether you have clear instances of the different places that you've had to network with other people. And then of course, there will also be like um, clear instances that show how you maintain and build relationships. So maybe if you met some people while you were in secondary school, and then you ended up three or four years later working with those people on some kind of project. So that sort of tells the, people, the reading committee that you're not just creating relationships, but that you're maintaining the relationships. And then you go a step further to show that you not only maintain that relationship, but you are able to leverage that relationship to get something done. That's the core of you being influential. The more instances you can provide, the better a candidate that you're going to look. For me, when I was writing my essay, I mostly talked about how I leveraged the relationships I had to try to organize scholarship hacks. I leveraged, I talked about how I was working with someone back when I was doing my NYSC. We both worked on the library project together back when we were NYSC. And then I now told her about the business and we started building a business together like two years later. So that sort of still connects because I talked about, like I mentioned her name specifically when I was writing my leadership essay, because I wanted them to know that this is a real person, that I'm not just making things up. Some people make up stories, right? Please don't make anything up. Write exactly what happened. Talk about your experiences. If you, to make it more clear and convincing, include the names and dates, if possible. The names of the people you collaborated with, the organizations you partnered with, those type of things. It makes it more real. Especially if someone can actually go on Google and verify exactly what you've said. To date, you can still go to my Instagram channel, my Instagram, yeah, my Instagram page, and you will see the video of the Jigawa State Television talking about um, Osita James and his colleagues building some libraries in Jigawa. It's still on my Instagram page to today. And I, that video was created in 2017. So even if they had wanted to do a quick check to verify if I was telling the truth or not, they would have found the evidence there. And the good thing about having evidence is that once someone can verify one or two things about what you've said, they are likely to believe the rest of the things you've said. So that's, that's like a good place to start. Think about the different people that you've had to interact with over a period of time. Don't think about just in the context of maybe I was volunteering. So like I was saying, um, the networking essay, what they're trying to test is to figure out whether you're someone that is influential. So feel very free to talk about all the experiences that you've had, where you had to like collaborate with different people, even people that are not even your friends, right? For example, I talked about being part of the NHES scholars in 2017, how I met some people, and then I eventually worked with those people to be able to accomplish something subsequently like two, three years later. 
right? So the idea is that if I met them in 2017 and I was able to work with them in 2021, the first assumption is that I was able to build relationship. Then the second assumption is that I was able to maintain the relationship. Then the third assumption is that I must be influential to be able to get them to help me accomplish the goal, the desired goal that I wanted without necessarily having to pay them. It's very, very important. If you pay people to do things for you, you're just an employer, you're not influential. You're actually not influential. The fact that, oh, I run a business where we had 10 people working in the factory, that doesn't make you influential. What makes you influential is because it's about leadership, it's your ability to inspire other people to want to join you to do something because they think that it's, for the, it's positive, it's for the greater good, you know, it's going to help other people or simply because it's a very good idea, right? So that's sort of how to think about it. It could be that you are working with someone and then you guys, um, he left the office or you left the office then two years later, you reconnected and then you're now building a startup together. It could be something like that. But it really just shows that you maintain the relationship, you build the relationship, you maintain the relationship and you are able to leverage that relationship to accomplish something. So that's why I said that the networking essay also should follow the star approach. You must be able to show that you build, maintain the relationship and that you have leveraged that relationship to lead to a result, right? So you can talk about the situation that was on ground when you just started um, building, when you just started trying to leverage that relationship, the task that you had at hand, you know, then of course the action that you took together with the person that you're, you're referring your networking AC and what that resulted in. So it's still the same, it's still the same style approach, but just used a little bit differently. You first have to figure out like which person you want to use. Because remember that the number of words are limited. So you can't just like write about all the people that you know. That's not going to be very useful. So for me, I would advise to have like a minimum of three. A minimum of three. The human mind understands things in threes. So if you have three points, it's sufficient. I had only three leadership experiences in my AC. There were three. And I still got the scholarship. Right. So once you write anything that is beyond three and is not very interesting, the likelihood that they will remember is very low. You can go and check it after this call. You can go research it. Human, the human mind understands information in threes. It does. So just sort of try to structure your essay. I'm not saying have three paragraphs. Please do not do that. That would probably be very grammatically incorrect, especially when you have like different points. You don't want to lump them all in one paragraph. I didn't say that. I said three central ideas, right? Three central ideas. Like you're talking about your leadership experience, three core leadership experience. Then everything else you're talking about in the essay is broken down into the start approach situation, the task, the action and the result. And then you reiterating how, as a result of the kind of experiences that you've gotten over a period of time, over the years in this particular industry, that you feel that being a part of the Shevening of uh, Scholars program is going to enable you with the kind of, is going to empower you with the kind of skills that you need to accomplish the big vision. So don't just write about your leadership experience and the leadership part. Also remember to point out what your big vision is because most people start their essays by talking about what leadership means to them. So, but it's not very useful to do that if you don't have a core example to support the first statement that you just made. So if you're going to start your leadership essay by talking about what leadership means to you, I would suggest you support it with something that has happened that directly relates with that quote. For example, my definition of leadership was a firm commitment to the right values. And what I did was that I talked about when I had two options, either to stay back in Lagos and bribe someone so that they can change my NYSE posting or to go to Jigawa. That's how I started my essay. So I had two options, either pay someone a bribe so that he would change my posting to Lagos and I'll stay in Lagos and work with a law firm that was going to pay me 144,000 as an NYSE associate or go to Jigawa with all the uncertainty, not even knowing whether I'll get a job or whether I'll be able to do anything useful throughout that one year. So see how what I just mentioned supports the first statement, which was that for me, 
leadership is about a firm commitment to the right values. I really hope you're paying attention because these things actually really count. You, if you're going to talk about um, what leadership means to you, be sure to support that statement with a leadership experience that resonates with what you just said. So that that way, the person that is reading it is drawn in to want to know more about your personality based on what you've just said that seems really interesting. So I'm going to move to the next AC because I've talked about the leadership AC right now. I've also talked about the networking AC. I actually spent a lot of time there. Then for the, um, what's it called again? The study justification AC, that's what I call it, but they call it the study in the UK AC. So when you're thinking about that one, it's very useful to first identify the schools that you want to attend, right? It's not useful to start writing first. It's not, it's not going to work. You need to actually identify the schools that you want and sort of structure your reasons for, I, for choosing those schools. So what I did was that before I started writing it, I did a research on the different schools in the UK that offered entrepreneurship and innovation courses because I'm an entrepreneur. I have um, two, three different startups running back in Nigeria, even right now. And I have like a lot of background in business. I sort of moved away from law. And then I also have like a background in technology and so on. So I wanted to do a master's in entrepreneurship and innovation, but I first had to do some research because I was tired of theories. I felt like a lot of universities would tell you the theories, but to build a business has very little to do with theories. I wanted a program that was practical, not so theoretical, but very, very practical. So I checked all the big schools. I mostly saw theoretical courses, so I didn't select them. I had to check and check until I found the Nottingham Trent Business School. And when I looked through their modules, I saw that they had like an entire semester that was just going to be focused on a hands-on project where you actually have to build, build out some kind of venture and get the opportunity to pitch this venture to actual investors. So that was why I chose the school. That was why I chose the school. It didn't matter that Oxford and Imperial College were all offering the same course. What mattered to me was the fact that these specific schools, that this particular school had a practical content that was going to be more useful for the type of skills that I was looking to get. So this is very important because they're going to ask you during your interview, if you just say, oh, I want to go to Oxford and this and that, it will seem very flimsy, like very flippant, like you just want to go to Oxford and that's it. You know, why Oxford, right? Why not University of Southampton? Why not University of Sussex? Why not, why not, yeah, why not University of Sheffield? Why Oxford? Don't say Oxford because Oxford is the best university in the world. You're probably going to be kicked out because it will seem like, oh, you know, since they're giving the scholarship, I might as well decide to go. And nobody says that you can't apply to Oxford. Please don't get me wrong. But the point is that if you're choosing Oxford, have a specific reason that aligns with your core interest. For some people, they argue that Oxford had like the best course for something like, um, yeah, for, for law and finance, because they have like an MSc in law and finance. And they were like that the people that have gone there have ended up working with um, some of the big international corporations like International Finance Corporation, where they are trying to help facilitate development funding for developing countries. So it depends on your reason. But whichever school you decide to choose, don't simply say, I want to go to the London Business School because it's the best business school. Please do not say that. Please and please do not say that. Only say it if you know that the London Business School has specific things in their core programs and modules that directly resonate with the kind of skill set that you're looking to gain and that can support your current career trajectory. So it's useful to start by talking about like something in the industry that has gone wrong that requires your type of course or your type of expertise to solve. So how I did mine was that I was trying to talk about how Africans are the ones that need scholarships the most, sub-Saharan Africans, and yet they are the ones that don't get as much scholarship as other countries. And I mentioned that one of the reasons why this happens is because of lack of information. And I justified these things with research. I didn't just say it, it was not my opinion. There were actually research papers that were published talking about these things. 
And then I went on to then say that um, the Africa needs people that have the kind of expertise that it requires to put together a very comprehensive database so that more and more Africans can gain access to quality education, leveraging the large number of scholarships that are already available for Africans. To give you a little bit of context, there was a year that 100,000 scholarships went un unreceived. 100,000 scholarships meant for Africans. And the reason was that people didn't know about them, so they didn't apply. These are the type of things that you can say in your AC that can attract or pique someone's interest or attention. So do your research. Don't just write because you feel. No, please don't feel. Justify your research. Justify your position with research. So that's sort of how to convince people when you're writing an AC. So after you've done that in the first part of the study in the UK AC, then the next part that you then move to is say that my first choice is XYZ University because XYZ University offers XYZ modules, which are quintessential to learning how to do XYZ. So for example, I can say that the University um, Nottingham Trent Business School or Nottingham Trent University offers modules in entrepreneurship and innovation that are very core to understanding how to build ventures in a global context trying to explain that, trying to build something of the nature that I'm trying to build requires expert knowledge. You can't just build it by simply trying to build it. The more knowledge and information you have about building and interacting with other young entrepreneurs as well, the better you can get at building something that is truly sustainable, right? So you can also make the justification by saying that most of the, most of the Nigerians that have gone on to raise funding $1 million and above are all people that were that have foreign education. If you can justify it with facts, with research, it can count. So again, if you're following, please type something on the chat box so that I'm sure that we're actually here paying attention. If you can follow, if you can hear me, please just type something on the chat box. Great, thank you. So after you've written that this is your first choice, then go on to write about the second choice and then the third choice, but always emphasize more on the first choice. Because even when you come for your interview, that's the first thing they will ask you. Oh yeah, you've selected this specific university. You know, can you tell us why you chose this university as your first choice? You know, so they already know that you just put the other two choices, mostly because when you apply for Chevening, you're required to submit an unconditional offer after you've gotten the, the scholarship, you're supposed to submit it on, I think, 14th July, latest by 14th July. So, but typically um, they expect that you apply to those other schools as some kind of plan B, plan C, right? That the school that you're really interested in is your first choice. So when you, like, I don't know, that was my own experience. They didn't really ask me about the other schools. They were more interested in the school that I selected as my first choice, right? So emphasize more, about why you selected that specific school, emphasize it more than you emphasize others, right? Because others are just going to be backup plans in case the other school doesn't give you the unconditional offer earlier enough, then you can just decide to then take the unconditional offer from the second choices and then still take up your scholarship. I hope that's clear. So again, if you're following, type on the chat box so that I would know that you're following. And if you have questions, please just type them on the chat box. Once we start the question and answer, the Q&A, you know, we can address that as well. So the final essay that you're expected to write. Oh, great. Thank you, Chamaka. So the final essay that you're expected to write is the career plan essay. Now, here's the tricky part. Most scholars that I know started by writing their leadership essay. Then they went on to write their networking essay. Then they went on to write their study in the UK essay, and then they went on to write their career plan essay. You don't have to write it in any format. In all honesty, people are different. That's what I will tell you, right? I'm not advising you to write it in any format, but I'm simply saying that just choose the format that works for you, that helps you to figure out how to structure it. Because, because, when you're trying to structure your career plan essay, the idea is that you're sort of trying to summarize um, some of the points that you've made in your earlier essays. 
And I also think that even on the platform, when you're trying to submit, you will see that the essays are organized in a certain way. So what the person that is reading it is likely going to flow from that logic, from top to bottom, right? So if it's going to flow from that logic, then it makes sense that the narrative should sort of support each other from the top to the bottom. So if the career plan essay is the last essay on the application form where you're supposed to like fill out the different essays, then it means that whoever is going to read it is probably going to read from the first to the last one, which might end up being the career plan essay. So just to put that into consideration, but in the career plan essay, um, the structure is really to first start by talking about, um, you know, paint a picture of, again, the problem in a bigger global context of the problem in your specific industry that your course or the type of skills that you're supposed to get from your course is supposed to help you solve, right? So for some people, they were into agriculture. So in that part, they talked about the, I think, food and agricultural organization and the UN talking about global hunger, you know, and how the, and how those problems are, you know, even much more visible in their home countries, you know, because the idea of Shedney is that after you're done with your studies, you go back to your home country. So if you can also point out how a global problem is even more pronounced in your home country, that can also like be very helpful, right? Then the, the next thing to do in the career plan essay is to use the SMART approach to structure your goals. Because the idea is that they want to know, do you have a plan after your master's, after you've been given the scholarship and you're done studying for your master's, what are you going to do next, right? That's like, that's just like what the essay is trying to figure out. Like, do you have a plan? Are there people that you're looking to partner with? You know, who are those people? And have you started thinking about it? Or are you like, oh, you know what? I'll just get to the UK first and I'll figure it out. You know, so they want to know, do you have a plan? You know, if you're thinking of coming back to Nigeria, it's very useful to like plan ahead of time. So do you have a plan? What's the plan? So that's just like the idea. Do you have a plan of what you're going to do when you come back to Nigeria? So that's just like the idea, right? So you can divide, you can structure your plans from the immediately you return, then there's a mid, mid, uh, mid plan, that's, then there's a long term plan. So there's a mid term plan where you talk about what you're looking to do like after three years, after you're back, right? Then maybe you're talking about having already built on the experiences of working with some of the partners you've mentioned uh, in the essay immediately you get back, that you're just going to now leverage this relationship as well as the skills that you've gotten to maybe do something much more bigger. Because the idea is that every other year you're supposed to be improving yourself. So if you were able to impact, say, 500 people by the time you came back from Shevening, by the midterm plan, you should be able to impact like you know 3,000 people or more, leveraging your broader networks and the Shevening community as well. You know, it's really important to mention how you're thinking of leveraging the Shevening community because every country that is part of the Shevning um, scholarship countries also has like alumni bodies, right? So you, you can mention, if possible, if there's an alumni that's doing something that you're interested in doing, you can say that you plan to partner with this alumni. Honestly, you can. You know, in all honesty, you can. You know, there's no hard and fast rule as to what and what not to include. The only thing that is important is that your idea is very clear. Like it's very clear to understand, clear to read. You know, don't just jumble a lot of words together. Just first try to have bullet points, structure your ideas so that it's very clear what you're trying to accomplish in this particular essay. So that by the time you're done, you can read through again to be sure that what you intend to communicate is actually what is being communicated. It's very, very, very useful to do that. So you start by saying what you want to do immediately you come back from the UK. You know, maybe you can say that, um, there are some bodies or organizations or NGOs. During my time, I talked about an NGO that currently works with Shevnin, right? So I talked about how I, I really love what they're trying to do in education. So I, I talked about school administration and not just compiling scholarship information. So I sort of extended my thoughts around what I can use technology to do to improve education access and the quality of education in Nigeria as well. You know, so I was saying that these guys are already doing lots of trainings, working in partnership with schools, that they're going to be my first point of call once I come back from, from the UK after my studies. 
that I'm going to work with these guys, uh, including, yeah, I work with them to also like expand some of their projects to other regions of Nigeria because they're currently focused in a specific region. Then for the midterm, I talk about how I want to like start getting more involved with policy and start to shift towards technology for development and start to work with nonprofits that are, what's it called again, that are consulting for different countries on how to do digital transformation, you know, improving education system through technology and things like that. But the point was that I had a clear plan. It was clearly written out. I had to put them in bullet points before I started writing. And I think that just doing that for yourself before you jump right into it can really make a real difference in the way your essay will eventually turn out. So uh, I think I've spoken too much already, uh, but I think I'll open up the floor for q and I will start by answering the questions on the chat, but if you have more questions as we go, please feel very free to jump in. Is that all right? Uh, can anybody hear me? Can you type on the chat if you can hear me real quick, please? Please, if you can hear me, can you say something on the chat? Okay, great. Thank you, Priska, for that. So if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and the floor is yours. So I'm going to, going to scroll through the chat now to see if there are any questions and I'll start to answer them one after another. Okay, great. I just have one question here. Please explain how you emphasize on the first school choice again. Okay, great. So um, I was trying to explain that the first school is largely um, sort of where the focus is. The focus is on the first school because the first school is your first choice. It's your first choice. All the other schools are like backup schools. So the school that you put in your first choice should reflect a level of depth in research. You can't just say, I want to go to the University of Bath because, oh, you say general things, they have teaching excellence, they have research excellence, they are number five in the UK, all those things are too general. They are too general. I'm being very honest with you. If I was on the Shevnin reading committee and you sent that, I would not, I would not shortlist you. Definitely not, because it's too general, right? The idea is that you have to think about what is different about this school from all the other schools that still offer the same course. So that's sort of where you start to like get those nitty gritties, right? What is different about this particular school? Why this school? Why not other schools, right? Is it that they have a professor that is, his, his core research work is an area that you're interested in and you're looking to get mentorship from this professor during the, during the course of the year, right? Is it the professor or is it that they have like a center, like in, at Nottingham Trend, they have like an entrepreneurship center where people build enterprises so you can meet other entrepreneurs, you can be part of their programs and things like that. Yeah, so I saw that and that was part of the reason why I decided to come to Nottingham, the Nottingham Trend Business School, right? So, and then I talked about how their terms were structured in a way that allowed me to really take advantage of the practical aspects of building businesses because I'm already building several businesses. So I didn't feel like uh, I would be making good use of my time to just go learn more theories. So I felt that the only way I can make good use of my time is if I'm doing a course that is largely practical, that is largely practical. And when I went for my interview, I re-emphasized the fact that I chose the school because they, they have a very firm focus on practicality in the execution of the entrepreneurship course. So yeah, so this is your chance. I know that you're probably writing your essays and you probably have gotten somewhere or yeah. So whatever it is, let's hear it. If you can't speak, you can just type on the chat what your questions might be so that I can respond to it and help you like address some of the issues you will currently be having with the issues that you're working on. Hello, are we still here? Okay, I can see a chat and the chat box. Let me do that real quick. Okay. 
Yeah, so do we have any questions? I think there's a Q&A, a short Q&A. Yeah, I really think that this is the opportunity to like just ask any of those questions that may have been bothering you. Either you're still in the process of trying to complete some of your essays. You know, even if it's you don't know whether your leadership ex experience is relevant, you can ask me. You can tell us what the leadership experience is and yeah, you can take it from there. Yeah, hi, Obina. Can you unmute yourself and speak? Or do you, do you want to type on the chat? You could do that as well. Oh, great, Priska. Thank you for asking that. Uh, so Shevlin, Shevlin doesn't necessarily have a clear cut criteria for selecting candidates for the scholarship. Although they will tell you that they're looking for people that are influential, people that have leadership qualities. Yeah, all those things are on their website. You know, but you know, down to the details of you know what you're going to do and what you're not going to do, and you're like hundred percent sure that you'll be selected. I think is very subjective at the very least. Uh, in some ways, there were some documents circulating, but like I said, these things are like my own opinions. They don't reflect the opinion of the FCDU. So there were some documents circulating that sort of showed uh, what they were looking out for, it, and the criteria that they would use to grade candidates during the interviews. Yeah, so there was there was also something like that. So I can share that to the FON group uh, if that would help. I think there's a document like that that just sort of shows what uh, Shevnin is going to like look at during your interview. But I think it might be outdated, or it might just give you some sense, some ideas on you know some of the criteria. You know, but for like a wholly general criteria of which if you meet it, you must get the scholarship. I, I'm not sure that there is one. Okay, great. Thank you, Obina, for that question. Uh, yes, I do know someone that has a tutu that has gotten the scholarship. He's actually pretty popular. Um, yeah, he's actually pretty popular. He got the scholarship. And I, I think there are also other people. Uh, I don't think your grade, I, I honestly don't think your grade matters so much to Shevlin. I think it's about your leadership, your experience, you know, your ability to show them exactly what it is the problem that you thought of that you're currently working on, you know, a problem that you're very passionate about, that you want to learn more about or get more skills to be able to tackle back in your home country. So I don't think you should focus so much on your grade. I, I think you should focus more on yourself as an individual. What are the things that you're excited about? You know, what, what is it that you're looking to go study in the UK? And, you know, how is it that you think that the Chevron Scholarship can help you? That's what I think you should focus on. I, I know some people that have to do that got the scholarship. So that's what I would say on that. So guys, like any more questions? I think the deadline is like, is it 12 o'clock or thereabouts? This is a period to like ask the questions. If you have more questions, please drop them on the chat. Please, there are no stupid questions. Please, there are no stupid questions. Anything at all that is bothering you uh, concerning the Chevron scholarship, you can just put it on the chat or you can turn on your microphone and speak, please. So from the website, they said that the deadline is 1st of November. First, so, but I don't know the time. I don't know the time. I haven't checked, but I know that the deadline is supposed to be 1st of November. I know that one for a fact. I know that one for a fact. So. If you start writing your essays, now would be a good time to like sort of just review it, you know, using some of the things that we've talked about today, right? It'll be pretty useful to just think around it so that you don't like just write essays that are very unstructured because one, it's not going to help you communicate and two, uh, yeah, it, it just really not help you communicate. The second one is that you may not be happy with the outcome at the end of the day, you know, who knows, but just try to structure your essays so that it can be very clear what exactly you're trying to communicate. Yeah, so Dr. Eze, there's going to be an interview process. After you're done, um, after you've been shortlisted based on the strength of your issues, you know, your leadership and all that, there's going to be like an interview, a formal interview at the embassy <laughs> where they sort of have a conversation with you one-on-one -on -one. You know, to find out more about the things you've written about in your essay, you know, questions sort of also revolve around the four um, 
the four key um, aces, the questions sort of revolve around that as well. We just want to get to know you, you know, get to know how you, what you're thinking about, you know, what you're currently doing and what you hope that going for the Chevney Scholarship would help you achieve. And of course, I will do another video like this um, subsequently for those that will be shortlisted so that they can also know like what to look out for and so on. So Dr. S, I hope that answers your question, please. If it does, you can just type on the chat box so that I would know that that has addressed your question. So Chamaka, you said, please, can you throw more light on identifying the leadership position? So what if one doesn't have a clear cut? Okay, thank you, Dr. Eze. What if one doesn't have a clear cut project one has carried out to identify specific results with figures? Yeah, this was what I was saying earlier. Everybody's leadership experience is different. So for me, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been doing enterprising things for a very long time. I've been doing enterprising things for a very, very long time. So I built on my strengths. So your strengths might be different. Maybe your strength was that you were the fellowship mommy or you were the fellowship welfare officer and there were some students that had not paid school fees. And then it was you that was co collaborating with the, the, the higher leadership or higher management, you know, trying to reach out to alumni to raise the school fees. Maybe it was you that was doing that, right? And as a result of that, your effort, over three students have their you know, first semester or yeah, or their yeah, said first semester or second semester tuition paid. So it can it can be that. It doesn't have to be like a specific project. It could just be that you were part of a group, you know, this was going on, and then you decided to do something about it. You know, but like remember that the star approach, you know, just really helps you to think around uh impact think about your leadership experience and the perspective of impact because you have to talk about the results. So I think that if you don't necessarily have like a leadership uh, position or something like that, or a clear core project, whatever you're going to talk about, ensure that you emphasize the result. What was the result? You know, the result could vary from, oh, over 5,000 students got access to information as a result of my work as the editor-in-chief of our of our SUG magazine, you know, it could be that. It could be anything, really. Like I said, there's no clear-cut um, statement or expectation as to what a leadership experience should be. We are diverse individuals. We're dynamic individuals. So leadership experiences can vary. But what's important is that when you structure it using the STAR approach, you're able to show clearly that there was a situation, you know, you did something about it, and it resulted to something positive. So Chemaka, if that's answered your question, please just type on the chat real quick that it has answered it so that I will know that I've addressed your question. Thank you very much. So for Priska, you said, please, can you emphasize on the career AC? Uh, so yeah, I, I talked about it earlier. Like I said, in your career plan AC, it's useful to structure it in it's using, it, using the SMART model because the SMART goals, you know, goals have to be SMART for them to actually like be achievable, right? I'm sure everyone here probably knows about the SMART approach to like goal setting. You know, it has to be specific, measurable, actionable, result-oriented, and time-bound, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So just sort of structure your goals like that. Don't just say, oh, I want to be governor of my state, or I want to be a minister. Uh, a lot of people are probably going to say that, you know, but I'm not saying don't say it, but if you must say it, you have to show how. Is it a SMART goal? Or are you just like leaping? Like, are you leaping from a master's graduate to like the minister of Nigeria? Like, how does that work? What happens in between? Who are the kind of people that you want to work with? Do you want to have worked in government for like four years? You know, just think around it. That's just sort of what I mean. You know, use the SMART model to think around your goals and structure them in different paragraphs. You could have the short term, you know, you could have the medium term, and then you have the long term. The short term can be immediately you come back from, from the Chevron scholarship to the to your home country. You know, what do you want to start doing immediately? Who are the players you want to work with? Are there any people that you're looking to collaborate with? And if you met like different, yeah, of course you will meet like the different scholars that you're going to meet while you're in the UK, that's also Chevron scholars like you. Uh, are you planning to collaborate with some of them on anything? If you are, what are some of those things? Like, don't just say I'm planning to collaborate with them to create impact is too general, it's too vague. So be specific, say exactly what you want to do. 
And yeah, I think you're going to be fine. So Priska, if that answers your question, I would also like you to type on the chat if that answers it, uh, if it doesn't, so that we can also throw more light on that. Okay, so like I said, like I was saying just earlier now for the career plan EC, please ensure that you structure it in a way that is easy to read. My advice from my own experience is to use paragraphs. Use different paragraphs showing maybe your short-term goals, your long-term and the mid-term. Your short-term goal can be what you want to do immediately you come back from the UK, right? But remember that you have to use a smart model for goal setting. Don't say you want to come back from the UK and you want to become a commissioner in your state. I mean, it doesn't feel very plausible. It is possible, but it doesn't feel very plausible, right? You need some time to settle into the environment, right? You probably need some time, right? So saying that you're going to achieve that immediately you come back from Chevlin, it might look like a stretch. I'm not saying it is, but it might look like. Right. So the problem is not what you're saying. The problem is how the person you're saying it to is going to understand it. You know, so just sort of think about it from their perspective, put yourself in the shoes of the reading committee. If it's to, an aspiring scholar was telling you that they're going to come back from Chevron and they will become the governor of their state, you know, during the period of the one year or two years after they come back from Chevron or they become a commissioner in their state, like, would you believe them? So that's sort of how to think about it. If someone were to say the same thing to you and you were in their position, would you believe them? If the answer is no, then don't say it. That's sort of how to think about it. But if you know that if someone said that to you, you would say eh, it's possible, then maybe it can work. But always think about it from their perspective, seeing like thousands of ACs, are they really going to spend their time trying to figure out whether what you're saying is true or not, or whether it's plausible or not? You know, so sort of think about it from that perspective. Your career plan AC has to show what you want to do immediately you get back and then what you want to also do in the long term. If you want to do a PhD, I would say that it's okay to put it. I won't say don't put it, but I would say don't put just that because most people think it's logical. Like I've done a master, so the next thing I want to do is a PhD, right? So just saying that, oh, I'll come back, I'll stay two years and I'll go back to the UK to do a PhD to learn more. You know, it doesn't really show, it doesn't really tell them so much about the different things that you could have used the skills to do back in your home country, right? So the, the idea is that doing a PhD is like for yourself, it's specific to yourself, but coming back and organizing like web seminars on how people can, you know, maintain health to improve the public health in a particular state, for example, you know, so that's more external. So it's more likely to drive interest than just things that are internal. So yeah, I think that's just like some of the things to think around when you're working on your career plan EC. So Dr. Eze, does that answer your question now? If you could drop a chat, that would be very great, please. Dr. Eze, are you still there? Yes, I'm there. Thank you so much. It does. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So for those of us that have written drafts of our ACs, um, so do you have any questions? That would be really great at this time. You know, just if you have more questions apart from the ones that have already been asked, so that we can also just go over them and be sure that you know exactly you know, how to think around it and how to get into it. So is there anyone that has a question? <laughs> okay, I will take that as a no. That's all right, but please feel free to drop your questions on the FOM group, even after we're done with this recording, right? I'm also going to try to, sh I'll share the link to the recording as well. And when I have the time, then I can upload to YouTube so that people in the next year that also want to apply can watch the video to learn more around how to structure their issues and so on. So, but yeah, thank you all so much for being here. 
And yeah, it was really great just sort of engaging with the questions and telling you the little that I knew about the scheduling application process. Uh, it's been a day, yeah, but I'm grateful that I'm here and I'm glad I was able to do this to help. So if you need more help, feel so free to drop me a chat on WhatsApp. Uh, I can drop my email on the chat real quick. I'm dropping my email on the chat real quick. So you can just drop me an email or you can drop an email to Flourish Opportunities Network at gmail.com. Yeah, so you can send an email either to me or to Flourish Opportunities Network at gmail.com and you will get all the answers that you need relating to the issue of scholarship. So those that were asking how can they join the FON group, so let me type my Nigerian line real quick. So you can just send me a DM on WhatsApp and I'll add you to the group. Yeah, so I'll give that five minutes so that you can take down the number if you want to chat me up so that we can add you to the group and then we'll bring the meeting to a close. Again, thank you all so, so much for being here. And if you have any comments, whether on this particular scholarship or on other future ones you want to do, you can feel free 